Let's go, Brandon. Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Dive Bomb Industries. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the fucking world famous, he wears wool and tweed on a hunt, Andy tweed. Shaver. Tweed, tweed. Jeff. Like a nice, what did yeah. Guggenheim call me today? Uh, Regal. A dapper Scotsman. Dapper Scotsman. Regal Re- AF. Regal AF. <laughs> you know, I don't I, think AF means Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, no, it means, you know what it means, Jeff. As fuck Joe Biden. As fuck Joe Biden. <laughs> um, so... I want to thank you guys. We got cut short last night. Uh, well, we do have to feed people. That's part of the no, plan. No, no, no. Listen, Jeff, that's Bush League. That's Bush League. Um, we, finished up, we finished up early enough today. We can do a, a second part of uh, what we started last night. And I'm just going to throw it out there. Dinner last night and dessert were both worth pressing pause for a few <laughs> minutes. That was yes. really, really good stuff. For it, The first time you've been here, first, uh, first time you've ever been here, are the cookies as much as everyone says they are? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't think there could be much more to a chocolate chip cookie. And, uh, yeah, it was really, really, really good. Michelle's chocolate chip cookies are as good as anywhere I've ever been. Yep. And I don't eat chocolate chip cookies much if I go somewhere else. I'd rather have an oatmeal cookie. But I'm with you. She makes a damn good chocolate chip cookie. Yep. No, it's, and it's, I think it's the, the amount of butter that's she, in there. It's the it, perfect amount. It's the kind of butter she uses, too. That's the secret to the whole deal. It's there the you go. government because, butter. Because she, used some, she made some last summer for something, and we couldn't get that butter yet. And the cookies were not as good as they were. They were very good, but they weren't as good decadent as they would. And it's the oven, too. Like, if she does it in a different oven, it's not the same. They cook better at the, in, in that oven. It, whatever it is. What, I don't know. She's all 25 the, years, and she's figured it out. All the cookie fungus in there. Well, yeah. whatever it is, I like it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And her bread pudding is almost as close. I don't Oof. know. If, did, what did we have for dessert last night? Brownies. 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 Ice, oh, she made brownies. Uh, brownie, fa- brownie ice cream. Last so, Kyle. We're yes. a, you're a political guy. You're sick of all this bullshit in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Too many of it, fucking man. sensitive pussies. Dude, I live in I live in Western Washington. There's pussies everywhere. <laughs> like my son lives in Western Washington. He told me the same thing. He said yes. dating is almost impossible there because it's hard to find a, someone. They hold it against you if you're not a liberal. He uh, said. Hundred percent. Yeah. He said when he goes out with someone, it's just it's just if you if you're a conservative from Texan. Yep. It's not automatic knock against you. He needs to go to Eastern Washington is what he needs because that's like the West is really where he's where going to leave is. Seattle and he's going to move to Boston. <laughs> not, a, not a liberal. Which I love Boston. I think, no, once you get outside of Boston, people are a lot different. And it's the same as it is out of the Seattle Tacoma area. Yes. You get away from there, it's different. Oh, yeah. Like where where I used to live in Washington, it was it was great. It was uh, I lived in Richland, Washington. It was all, you know. Uh, fruit farms, produce, farmers, ranchers, everything like that. Everybody hunted. You go to the west side and it's... A bunch of fruits. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A bunch of fruit cakes. Yep. N- land of fruit and nuts like California. That's right. So how does a kid from Washington State yep. end up working at Dive Bomb? Well, roundabout way, I moved from Washington to Michigan. And that's where I learned how to goose hunt and goose call. Um, and I had some, some really, really great mentors living there, um, uh, that introduced me to being in the hunting industry and then being entranced in the hunting industry kind of got the attention of Asher Tolliver and Cody Stokes I actually met them, uh, at a calling contest two years ago, uh, it was duck fest, introduced themselves or introduced myself to them and, uh, had a good conversation. And then they kind of scouted me out after that. That's pretty interesting. Yep. And now, the master is working for the JV guy. <laughs> right? <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna pin you down. Yeah, I know it. I know it. He's gonna pin you down. JV JV squad. The yeah. JV squad. I'm yeah. having more fun with this than you can imagine. Oh, I know. 
Because I'm look. sure Asher's going to call me. What the hell's this JV shit? <laughs> you think he's going to call you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait till you see this group text about to blow up. <laughs> I just call him the way I see him. Asher knows that. He's been doing with me a long time. Yeah. I yeah. think you two are the masters. How many world titles? So uh, you've got, t- if you count juniors, three. Three, and then you've got the one. I've, got, lo- I've got the, yeah, I've got the junior and the world live. So five. So five. Yeah. The JV have zero. Indeed. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That would be like saying that Andy, who played high school quarterback, could start at a Division One school as a quarterback. It ain't happening. It's just two different. It's peas in a pod. Asher's an athlete. He knows this. But I mean, he's got a World Series ring. If I would say he's the mentor at baseball compared to y'all. There you go. That's that's fair. Okay. That's fair. The, y'all are the JV baseball players. Asher's the pro. Y'all mm-hmm. are the y'all are the waterfowl pros. I mean, I like Kate a lot, so I hate to put Kate Kate's on the great. JV. So, you know, Kate can play on y'all's team also. Oh yeah, he can. He can. He, 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 even he, if he's riding the pine, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll get him that World <laughs> Series ring. Yeah. Now you played baseball a long time. Yeah, what? I I didn't make it near as far as Asher did. I played a little after college, played some independent ball, and uh, everything was going good. I I got hurt right before uh, I first became eligible for the draft, and it was looking like I was going to go in the late rounds. Left left-handed late inning reliever mm-hmm. kind of guy and um just got hurt at the wrong time in front of the wrong people so i couldn't even you know act like everything was fine it you know it was pretty apparent that i'd blown out my elbow and then uh, had to rehab it and you know baseball's one of the great sports because you can get to the big league so many different ways so i was trying to kind of go up another go up another branch of the stream and and go through indie ball and Things were going really well and had a great first season and was looking to move up into a different league and blew my blew out my arm again and figured it you know was what, it Tommy 20? John yeah yeah oh that's that's a bad surgery too yeah it's it's really not that terrible physically it's really tough mentally th- though because you know you get used to throwing a baseball in here in the seams when it comes just right as it comes out out of your hand and, and everything feels right. And, it doesn't really feel that much different after surgery, except the ball's going a heck of a lot slower. Right. And, uh, you know, it's I'd say that one's more of a mental game than anything. You know, it's it's crazy because Nick and Ryan, both at split read, both played minor league ball. You played ball. Asher, Asher was in the pros. I mean, there's a lot of baseball players, that, and there's a lot more than that. Well, and, and when, uh, when it was just Nick, Asher, and I, all three of us played at, you know, college or beyond as left-handed pitchers. You know, we were – you want to talk about a goofy squad of dudes? <laughs> you get three left-handed pitchers in one place, and there's some weird stuff that happens. But what what was your like high high speed? Uh, I, I didn't throw that hard. I think I topped out at 93. Um, That's but still humming it. It was it was pretty good. Uh, but the, my thing was I I couldn't throw a baseball straight to save my life. So I had a big sinker, good cutter, um, and actually one of the best compliments I've ever been given. I had an o- Oakland Athletic scout tell me that my curveball was every bit as good as Barry Zito's. So for most of the people that listen to this probably have no idea who Barry Zito is, but he had one of the best curveballs in big league history. Well, so he, he got paid big money, then just disappeared. Didn't he go to the Giants and just yeah, he's just kind of wasted away on that out. Oakland yep. Athletics, and then he went to uh, San, San Francisco. Francisco. And got, we got a big check, Yep, and then and well, then baseball checks are guaranteed. Yes. Yeah, Bobby Bonilla has got the best contract in sports. Darn right. Was it yeah. $11 million a year yes. or something like that? Yeah, for now, for the next 10 years or something. Jesus. When was the last time he stepped on a field? 1990 Yeah, it starts with a 19. That's, that's yeah. pretty good. I think he gets I think he gets 2 million a year now for the next 10 years is what it is or something. I don't think it's 11 million. I think it's like 2 or something. But it's a lot of money. How do I get one of those gigs? Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. What oh, heaven's mean, bringing man? me some coffee. Let me tell you something. This lady yeah. was only 5 minutes late for work today. Thank She's you, ma'am. Hey, that's that's sound 2 minutes from yesterday, right? That's right. Yeah. Tomorrow we're shooting for 3 minutes she late. She ran Andy and I off the road. Yeah. She did. You did too. We were trying to we were trying to just we were making our way to the lodge and then here comes this car beat to shit bad out of hell and I was like oh there goes heaven <laughs> hey what time it's 10:22 I got up at 3:15 7 I can I can I can have a beer heaven I'll get my own y'all go ahead I'm going to get a beer Y'all want a beer? Or y'all allowed to have a beer? I'm good. I'll be all right. all right. I'm good with coffee right now. Y'all have a limit on what y'all can drink because, like, my guides are allowed one or two beer on a night no, they work. No, we, we don't. We don't have an actual allowance. I have a limit on my guys. Do Listen, you? You t- and I don't really think I have anybody to worry about. Blake, when he's here, Blake, Andy, and Josh together do not make really good decisions. <laughs> like when we go to Oklahoma to hunt, I give them my card and I was like, just buy what you want, and. 
there's always extra pitchers of beer on the deal. I'm like, listen, guys, I'm buying food, and I'll buy you tea, but I'm not buying beer and shit all night long. And Blake is the worst about This is Blake right here. Y'all about ready to go? Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, Blake. Uh, can we get another can we picture, get one please? More picture, please? Uh, every time. I'm like, God damn, I'm ready to go. Yeah. You know? But with Jeff, you know, Blake's got that attitude, but we, he's well, he's a beer drinker. We don't drink a whole lot on this stuff. Uh, we had one night on our freelance trip a couple weeks ago that was, we got pretty good. We got pretty fired up, pretty tore up. You work hard and you get up early. Yep. Are you guys nappers? No. No, no we're not. not. Honestly, and most of the stuff we do, especially on the freelance stuff, you know, we might be on the road. I mean, gosh, what was that? Eight days that we filmed on that last freelance trip. Yep. We hunted morning and afternoon every day, but one. Uh, and one of those days, we tried to squeeze in three hunts. Yeah. Morning hunt went south quick, so we went to you know Plan B loaf option, and then you know either that worked out and we got it, or we you know tried ducks in the afternoon or something else in the afternoon. I mean, it's. It's go, 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 and, you know, at the same time, we got to go and scout. Yep. Three of us and one vehicle, we're trying to sort stuff out. So, you know, we, we don't get a whole lot of napping in. That freelancing stuff's got to be hard in a lot of places. Now, y'all got a lot of your, – your name's going to help y'all get into places. Mm -hmm. And if you say, hey, I'm hunting in western Wyoming, someone in western Wyoming that listens to the podcast, y'all's podcast, or is a dive bomb fan deal, them guys are going to be like, hey, I got a place for you. So, so that's going to open some doors up. But, boy, I'll tell you, it's getting harder and harder to freelance in this country. It yes. is. It is, people. Um, you know, I don't know if it's so much that farmers just like getting bothered about hunting. I think it's more so there's just enough people that go out there and do stupid shit that ruin it for everybody. Yeah, you yeah know, it just takes one dumbass that's, to screw that's up That's all for it everybody. takes. Some, some guy shoots through a couple extra pieces of, you know, sprinkler pivot, and then when they set it all up the next year, it starts – Coming out the main tube and knock on wood, we've <laughs> never had that happen. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a lot of dipshits that go to North Dakota and freelance that have never, have never really experienced what the soil type is like there. And then it rains, and then they're out there, either rutting up the field or getting stuck. And then they got, I mean, they can't get out. I know where we can go out here, and I have found out in Oklahoma the places I can go. But I had a tough curveball there because it's different soils. But First year there, Jeff got he. I had was, a farmer on speed dial. Yeah, I got stuck so many freaking times. But it was just like the road. Yeah. The road was terrible. He'd be like parked there, and you would just feel it just slide right in the, oh, yeah. right into the ditch. And, and and so it takes a while. When you go <coughs> places like that and you don't know, mm -hmm. you, you can't go driving through people's fields. I saw a picture from Saskatchewan this year of a truck buried, and the Canadian farmer said, this is why no Americans will be in my field from now on. Because yeah. they're no-till farming anyways. Yeah. And then they got this big-ass fucking ditch all through the damn thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, honestly, even even down around here, you get some really nasty stuff. I remember yeah. the first year I worked down here, um, you know, Justin really laid out which roads I could and couldn't drive on, and, and it's not even the full roads. You know, some of the, like, uh, by the McGuire over there, you know, you, you don't take the whole road. You can only go to one point, and then it gets right. bad after that. And you, I just remember hearing. You can't go west past the Big Bubble. Bingo, exactly. And, and just to see how many times Guggenheim managed to bury <laughs> yeah. that thing up to the top of the wheel wells. I don't, I've never even seen anyone who's able to get a truck as stuck as Eric Guggenheim. He is he is a, a talented person in many aspects. He is the best at getting a truck stuck I have ever seen. Yeah, he's been stuck more than anybody I know out here. Oh, definitely. And especially you should know where to go because I know what roads – I mean, we can get five inches of rain, and there's fields that we can get into that we know we can get into. It can be, you know, mid-wheel deep across the road, and you can still drive down. Yeah. And there's other places you get a half inch of rain you can't drive on. And there's three different roads that we use all the time that's got a section of a half mile that if it's wet, you can't go. So you go around. Yep. But then somebody like Googie, he's smarter than everybody, so he's got to go into the ditch. That's right. Yep. There was there was one time he got stuck about two, sto two toe straps off the blacktop. And instead of just leaving it there and waiting for someone to come around, he just kicked her into four low and got about 200 yards down the road. Just, to where, just far enough. To, to where we had to get, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. Anyway, got one of the farmers out there with the tractor to fix it. And then there was another time I thought Justin was going to kill him. Uh, it was, <laughs> like, time to go, right? And and with Eric, it's it's always about, you know, 15, 20 minutes late kind of thing. Well, we had enough mud there in the barnyard at Justin's place. Eric, I don't know if he had hooked up to a trailer or not yet, but he was starting to spin out there. He was getting stuck at the house. He was getting stuck at the house. He <laughs> finally caught and then shot into the darn pine trees. 
What the yeah. hell? <laughs> yeah. How do you manage that at the house? You have to be Guggenheim. <laughs> You have to be Guggenheim. I, I don't know. I love the guy, and and he is he's awesome. But holy cow, it was <laughs> he's hard on equipment. Vehicular issues are a common occurrence. And Justin is so wormy and stressed out about you shit. Oh my worry gosh. him out. You can oh pull that gosh. down, Kyle. I think it's raising up on you. Let me see if I can tighten no. it up. Down. Good. Good. Yeah. Boys from Washington State. That's you know, right. Explain right. to him a little bit different. So we we in uh, all the times he's been stuck. The, the, well, the, hold on a second, Jeff, because we the first pod, the only podcast we did with Guggenheim, we went to his house. Yes, and it was pouring rain, wasn't it? Pouring rain. And Googie's Road is the worst. And he told Jeff, he said, "Don't go east." What did Jeff do? I went west. No, you, oh no, no, west, west. Yeah. I'm sorry, don't go west. That's not the way you want to go. He went. Jeff went west. So we had to get Googie. Googie comes, try to pull us out. So guess what he does? He buries his pickup only about 100 yards, you know, further to that intersection than we were because we were in your pickup, weren't we? Yeah, we were stuck. So <laughs> Tony had to come in the middle of the night in his Jeep and rescue all of us. Wow. And then my truck the next day just drove out. We just drove it out. Didn't even have to get nobody to tow it out. Just boom. But you didn't. Guggenheim ended up in the ditch. You were just stuck in the road, yeah, weren't you? I was yeah. going to say, that's, that's the deal. That ditch will get you. I was with... Uh, Eric Bragg once, and his truck slid off into the ditch, and that was the end of that one. What a what a life. And this is what we do, and we enjoy it. And that was in summertime. Yeah. But there's nothing. The worst part is I got stuck in Oklahoma one year in a snowdrift mm. in the middle of the road. And I sat there for two hours. And this is the funny part. I got out, and I always keep bibs, the big jacket and stuff in my truck in case I happen. So I'm, it's free, you know, when it, when it snows like that anywhere out in this area, it's cold and miserable. I had to get out and put my bibs and my coat on, and I walked to a feedlot a mile away. And I get to the feedlot, and I get 100 yards from it, and the guy that works there on the front end loader pulls out. I'm thinking, hell yeah, and I'm like going like this, you know, waving my hands and shit. And he turned and went the other way, and I went all the way out of sight. And I was like, fuck. So I turned around and had to walk all the way back to my truck and sit in my truck. I was that close to getting saved and sat there for two hours until someone could come get me. And then when I get pulled out, I cross past the damn front end loader coming back to the feed lot as I was leaving. Oh. Damn. I thought that's just one of the days. But that's you know, uh what's the guy that did the book for uh Misery and Company for Ducks Unlimited? Uh Bill Buckley. He he shot some of that up here. Very truth, Misery and Company. That's a Someone needs to redo that book or do another book like that because it happens all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just kind of the everyday life of a waterfowler, right? Yep. Have y'all got? Have y'all ever got um, weathered in where you couldn't fly out to go to the next place to hunt? I I think so. I'm trying to remember where, but I'm I'm pretty sure I've at least been delayed. I know I've been delayed a day or two. You know, there have been a couple days where I don't even bother trying because it's just nasty. You know, it's either blowing forty or snowing or something like that. Yeah. I had a I had a uh, an attorney from Dallas, big very wealthy man that used to hunt with me. He's passed on a long time ago, but he had an antique airplane he bought, a plane from like the thirties or something, and he always wanted to fly it. And his one of his and his wife was always on his ass about it, so he could fly it out here because it was just a an hour and fifteen minute flight from Highland Park or wherever they lived at and stuff. So he called me and he said, "Can you pick me up at the airport? Now, my guys are coming, but I'm going to fly separate." I said, "Yeah, that's not a problem. It's right before Christmas." So. I said, yeah. I said, if you watch the weather, I, it's going to be good. It's good. I'll be out of there before it, the snow and the bad weather hits on the December 23rd. I said, okay. Well, on the night of December 22nd at my house, it started sleeting and turning to ice. And I told him at dinner that night it was going to get bad early. I had to be all right. I had to be all right. That, we'll be done in, by early in the morning, y'all said. So I, if I'm out here by 9, 930, it's not going to hit. That fucking plane the next day looked like it come out of the winter storm set on top of that plane. <laughs> So he comes up to me and he's like, and we were going to Lubbock. We had plans to go to Lubbock that day. He goes, uh, "Can you? I need y'all to take me to go get a car rental. I said, well, I'm going to Lubbock. You know, well, can you drive to Wichita? I'm not driving to Wichita and then back to Lubbock. I told you. So anyways, my dad ended up having to go to Abilene and take me to Abilene to get a rental car. And he had to leave his plane up here for like two weeks. And it was one storm after another. Kind of winter wish we'd have again, you know. And his plane sat up there. I think he'd call me every day worried about his plane. Will you go back and check on it? Yeah, well, I don't know what you want me to do to it. It's, yeah, it's tied down. That's still the best there. thing happened. Yeah, still a frozen block <laughs> still of ice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, I go by one day and his plane was gone. I was like, well, I, he didn't call me to see a check on it, so I'm assuming he picked it up that day. But from then on, his wife made him drive out here. Yeah, I believe it. 
The airplanes are really, really great unless you need to be somewhere. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Do you ever watch that show? Um, alone is not alone. Alone's the series. It's the one Mountain Men. You ever watch that series on Discovery? They've got a guy that goes there and he flies a little a little bush plane. It's a one seater, and he flies and goes up to cabin and traps, and that, that's how he feeds his family. But that fucker, I'm telling you, that's a, that's a life to just fly by yourself up there because. And he's had to put her down two or three times and fix something and carries extra parts with him and. That just that, that's a tough way to make a living. Yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, and it's it's pretty intimidating, especially in the you know the the wilds of the north. It's pretty wild stuff out there. You know, if you go down to the wrong spot, it's not not really all that great. We were just talking you this morning on the this drive morning. out. Yeah, yeah. yeah we we're just talking about how nice it is to be flying down over Texas and Kansas and Oklahoma, where even if I do have to fly at night, you know, God forbid something happens and that big fan on on the front of the airplane stops spinning and i start sweating you know got something probably got something pretty flat that i can land safely on and not have to worry too much so you fly by instruments also yeah yeah i don't i don't do a whole lot of it you know most of everything i do in alaska and the bad weather is very harsh visual um stuff because you've got mountains all around and as soon as you stop seeing where things are you know those those granite clouds always pop up in the wrong spots so you fly, but 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 you are rated to fly yeah. instrument or visual. Yep. Okay. Yep. So when you fly, you can you do fly at night in the dive bomb plane a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we cover so much darn country. It's it's kind of inevitable. You know, you, even if you get done with a hunt at nine or ten in the morning, sometimes you know to work it back to Colorado, I'll get there at you know nine ten at night. And, you know, it's you get quite a bit of night flying in. One one of our good friends in Oklahoma, one of our big farmers and ranchers, he's. Got, got bought him a plane and he was learning how and stuff and he was at the very end and had been doing uh was doing nighttime landing and taking off and he was still with the instructor he'd he had soloed already and was with him on this deal and freaking um engine through a rod or whatever the hell the engines do and it, the engine blew on him mm. after takeoff over the mountains up at where we hunt in oklahoma and the guy that was with him was the instructor and he said thank god he was there he hasn't been in a plane since then wow. that was enough for him to quit i don't blame him no but yeah that's not fun that that's, going down to new mexico is the first time flying in the dark yeah i, for I you. hadn't i hadn't flown in the dark yet so well, i was just like See, that would be pretty cool because you can see shit. That wouldn't bother me. Yeah. Little planes are fun. Big planes are no fun to fly in. Right? No. Yeah, they're it's just getting crammed into a Pringles yeah. can at no. 40,000 feet. Now, no, it's, p- private it's, jet, I've got to do that some. Dude, I'm telling you right now, I have cheated myself out of a good life by not making a whole lot of money because that's, <laughs> that's the way to roll, boy. None of that two-hour check-in bullshit. That's yeah. the truth. Just, that's the truth. Have you flown private before? Um, You know, I've... I've I've been close to guys that do when mm-hmm. I've gotten to see the airplanes. I've never gotten to actually go on a you know private chartered airplane there though. The first time me I me neither. First time I flew in a private jet, I asked the guy flying. I was like, uh, "Do I need to put my seat?" But we were talking. I was standing up talking to the two pilots, visiting with them, and I said, "Do I need to put my seatbelts on or fix land?" I'm like I don't. If you want to, you can. I said, "Well," and he said, "There ain't no fucking rules up here." So that's you do what you want to do. I said, "Okay," and took off. We have a um, one of my one of our clients. Uh, Scott Tarwater, that's been on here before, he's CEO of big companies and stuff. They were uh, they went to fly right after nine eleven, and the guy that was owned uh, John Q Hammond's hotels, which are all over. I mean, Southwest Missouri State and stuff. He's tons of money, big philanthropist. Anyways, he got to the airport. They told him take his shoes off. He said, "Fuck this." He went and bought a jet. <laughs> now, not everybody has that kind of pocketbook to go. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna go buy a thirty five million dollar jet, but he went and bought him a jet that day. And I ain't he, taking my shoes off. I ain't you. taking my shoes off. Went, walked out, went caught on the phone. They bought a jet that day, and he flew private every time ever since after that wow another oh. good friend of ours he's a pilot for the pace family mm-hmm. well we were talking about last night he had that accident uh right when he was taken off but jeff said if you fly with him commercial he's the worst passenger oh. in the world bitches about everything that damn cowboy up there fa- fast forward <laughs> slow down pushing button shit trying to imp- i don't know who the fuck he's trying to impress <laughs> then when you get on the airplane the first thing he does is looks in the cabin and if it's not some bitch with gray hair you don't like <laughs> he it. don't like him that fucking kid ain't even fucking shaving up there. He's got us <laughs> flying bullshit. I don't, you know. I, I've he's heard a, that one a time or two. I, I, I yeah. can see. Yeah. Because you look young, anyways. But but he gets, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but he stop. gets he gets nervous. He doesn't. He's not a very good deal. But I've flown with him in the jet before, and it's just as, you know, you pull up. One time we went to San Antonio to go play golf for a couple of days. I went to Fort Worth. He said, "Be here at seven o'clock," and I pulled up like six fifty. I'm I'm early, about ten minutes before. And he goes, you want some coffee? I said, yeah. He said, some in the, in the hangar. So I went in there and got me a cup of coffee, walked out. And my bags and my golf clubs were no longer in my truck. 
They were on the plane. He was closing it up. He said, let's go. We'll put it in there, open it up. We were, we were in the air three minutes later. I mean, I thought, this is the way to go here. We took off from Fort Worth at 7 o'clock. We teed off in San Antonio at 810 from the, from the country Damn. club there. Wow. Any, well, nowadays you wouldn't have to wear a mask. Mm-hmm. You Where? fly private. On, if yeah. you fly private, you don't have to wear a mask Fuck on a yeah. plane. No, you're right. Yeah. But you know if you get snacks on commercial plane and keep you a drink and snacks, you ain't got to wear your mask? They no. Just they get you a snack every once in a while. I'm they told you. us if you're actively eating or drinking, that's when you can take your mask off. They, but if you're done snacking. American was right saying on. that you, in between bites and drinks, put yep. your mask back on. Mm-hmm. Like, what They'll come this? back and tell you again. Just yeah. keep snacking. When we flew last time, I did that. Southwest has been the biggest pain in the ass. Yeah. For some reason, they, they are the worst about it. On my flight this summer, on our trips we took, they were the worst about the mask. Yep. Sorry, you need to put your mask on. Sorry, you need to put your mask on. Sorry, you need to like, Gosh, damn it, lady. Alaska's pretty bad, too, but they're also based out of Seattle. So, Well, there, there you go. Go figure. We flew Sun Country. We went to Cancun. We flew on a Sun Country deal. Mm-hmm. Best service in the world. Dude, Sun Country is legit. Them fuckers are never late. Plane's I, brand new. Yeah, and I, and I said something to the lady. I said, this has been the best flight I've had this summer on about five different airlines. This is by far the best. She goes, we don't ever delay nothing. She goes, we're out of Minneapolis. So we're used to bad weather. She goes, well, they make us fly all the time. Yep. And it was the equipment. was It was. It was brand new planes. Brand new seats, everything. Really? Yep. Never even heard of Sun Country. Yep. I've it's flown just, it one time from Nashville to Portland, yeah. and it was direct flight, brand new airplane, brand new TVs, everything yeah. worked. Yeah. It was nice. They flew Dallas to Cancun. It's just a charter service. That's what we flew last time, and it was yeah. good. I had flown on them before, though, and that's why I booked it. Yeah. I've, I've flown on them three or four times. I've always had a good experience with them. Mm-hmm. Spirit Airlines, I said I would never fly again because if you fly Spirit, the last time you fly Spirit, it's going to be a fucking debacle. Yep. Well, we're going to Cancun in February. And we are flying back on Spirit. We're flying American or flying back Spirit. But I don't give a shit if I get stranded in Cancun two extra days because me and Michelle ain't got nowhere to be anyways. Yep. I have kids. I have to get back. Like, I can't. Well, your wife booked it so on Spirit. So if y'all don't get back, then that's on your my in-laws. They just nickel. The Spirit to me is like yeah. they, they just nickel and dime because it's yes. like, oh, yeah, your, your flight's going to be $110. Yeah, what, but yeah. then the bear like, fare. <laughs> then, yeah, and then it's like, oh, for checking a bag, yeah, this much, uh, everything else, this much. It's like snacks. What's, what's that? You wanted you wanted both wings on the airplane? <laughs> That'll be yeah. another seventy five dollars. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And Michelle overpacks everywhere we fucking go. We look like if you ever seen the show Coming to America and she doesn't walk through the airport the first time. That's what it looks like with me and Michelle travel. You know, there's fifteen bags and three porters carrying shit. But even when we go to Mexico, I mean, we're going to fucking beach. She's going to wear a bikini yep. and a sundress. I'm going to wear shorts. A speedo, and that's it. I'm not really wearing a speedo, but that, I mean, you're not going to wear. And we still have all these fucking bags every time. I'm like, so spirit. It's gonna be. We, we might as well have first class on American coming home because it's going to cost us the same amount. Yep. Oh, that'd be four hundred and sixty-two dollars for two bags, sir. Yep. And pretzels. Oh, thirty-three dollars more. First class, free two free check bags. Yep. You you know what's good about the um, spirit though? You can pay twenty-five dollars more, and on the front they have seats that are two, they're only two seats instead of three. Yep. Fat Boy Luxury. I get them every time I'm on the deal. Oh, yeah. And them cheap fuckers that fly Spirit, they won't pay the $25 extra. I'm like, hell, I'm all about that. Well, yep. shit, Jeff, they have already nickel and dime them on the bags. They've already spent everything. I saw, like, an international first class on the last flight that I've, I, like, got to walk by it as they sent me to my little shithole. Jesus. You, like, lay down. There's TVs in it. Yep. Have you seen the ones with the uh, cocoons that you close up into your own little? No, I hadn't seen those. Yeah, those there's some. Sick. Crazy That's stuff em- out there. Emiratus, is that how you I say it? I think so. Emirates. It's Emirates, oh. whatever. It's the the, 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 yeah. the the camel lovers ones. Yep. yep. Anyways, those the suicide vest wearing people. Yep. They were they fly on that same bitch all the time. They got private showers in some of them rooms. It's unreal. Yeah. yeah. How do they put that shit on there? They 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 charge you fifteen thousand dollars no, for a flight. I know, <laughs> but like how do they have look at this shit. Hold on. I'm pulling it up. They got like a twin they got a, a full size bed. Yeah, you're oh, paying. Yeah, they're paying. They're making the same amount of money that they're making on a freaking sixty thousand dollar first class Emerald flight. Oh, how to get it for three hundred dollars? That's what we need to figure out, Jeff. No, you need to, because I'm not gonna embarrass myself. Man, how would you like? I mean, you'd be flying to France or something like that, yeah. and you like look across the you look across the little aisle there, and your door's closed on the neighbors, and then all of a sudden you just hear <laughs> just like <laughs> just your neighbors just smashing. I don't think that really counts as a mile high club like yeah. that. That's cheating. That's cheating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like to be to be in the true mile high club, like you got to cram your little ass in the bathroom. Now, you know? now, if you do the mile high club there and you have a shower. 
That's some really that's some that's big time mile high. Yeah. That's that old Odell Beckham Jr. Someone's pooping on me kind of shit right there. Yeah. I'm telling you. Look at that. That's ridiculous. Nobody should travel that way. Yeah, everybody should. We just can't afford it. I'd like to travel that way. No shit, me too. I'd be all about that shit. I'd walk in on my pajamas and my skivvies, boy, right there. I'd just go through the airport like I own that fucker. Fuzzy How, slippers yeah. and yes, everything. Yes, I'm telling you. How long of a flight do you have to have to justify spending that amount of money? Fuck, I'd go from Lubbock to Dallas that way. I could. I'd strip down, boy. <laughs> With, a bed? <laughs> With a bed and everything? Oh, I'd take advantage of that, sandwich. I'd ask them, I hope we get in a rain delay here. And they fly around <laughs> for three hours. Because uh, they, they left us on the tarmac whenever we came back from uh, St. Lucia for an hour and a half. Stuck in, it's, it's my wife, like we're just sitting like this, sardines, and it was, that wouldn't be that bad. Hell, you would welcome a delay. Yeah. I've never, fl- the farthest I've ever flown is from Dallas to uh, Fairbanks, and that was a fucking long day. I can't imagine flying from Dallas to Saudi Arabia nonstop or something, 14, 15 hour flight. That's a long fucking time. But if you're, if you're sitting on the bed like that, it's not so bad. You yeah. know? Imagine Britney Spears laying there next to you. And be yeah. Now, how long can you fly before you have to, like, sit down and take a, a break or whatever? In, in a dive on airplane? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, that one, gosh, I, I guess we get about six hours out of it. You can so, fly six hours? Yep. For I mean, until we are run out of gas. Okay. So Use, it's not like an FAA, like... No. What there, what's no. the most hours you can spend up in the air before it's like, hey, you got to. Commercial guys are eight or ten hours. It's the same as a truck driver. Yeah, to but, I mean, you've got stuff like, you know, the commercial stuff that, you know, you get 18 hours from Newark to Hong Kong and that kind of stuff. I mean, there's relief pilots, but, yeah. you know, basically that's that's kind of your work day after that. I'm going to. I'm going to get Danny Rags down with this, a buddy of mine. He flies, and he flies cargo, 777s or whatever it is, all over the world. And I want to ask him about that because I think that I think he told me one time that they'll fly like 8 or 10, 12 hours, mm-hmm. and then, then they go to the back and there's a room, yeah. probably about like whatever that is. They go to sleep for, you know, I, I don't know what the deal is. But on a little plane like yours, there's no hours. How far can six hours take you? How many miles? Uh, you know, with a good wind, I've, I've flown from – uh, Colorado to St. Louis, you know, Denver to St. Louis on one tank. And for a single-engine airplane, it's pretty darn good. Is there any places that you stop at airport that's got a restaurant that you like to go to? There's a whole bunch. There are, there, but there are good FO. Yes. Is it FO? F- F- FBOs. 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 Yep, there's a lot of those, and a lot of them have uh, courtesy cars. Uh, you know, get stuck someplace, borrow the car, you know, go to some restaurant. You know, I, I try to find any excuse I can, actually, to go down to uh, Abilene down there to – Check out Copper Creek. That's that's my favorite place. Andy don't like it, but Andy likes Texas Roadhouse, and that's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> different, different. The rolls. Class. I'm telling the you, rolls. Copper, Copper Creek the is butter. the best food I've had in my entire life. Bingo. That, I tell them all the time that Papa Do's is my favorite restaurant I go to, but that's but for not as a franchise, yep. Copper Creek is my favorite. What what you what do you get there? Uh, you got to get that smoked Caesar salad. That uh, mesquite I've never smoked. I've I've never had it. You got to do it. It's awesome. Smoked Homemade Caesar salad. Yeah, it, it's it's it does, the lettuce doesn't just taste like you know hard water. Right. Um, <laughs> it's really good. Uh, so that's great. And then um, get a I think it's a black and blue ribeye, uh, Oscar with crab on top. And then they've got a chocolate cake that's just stupid. We my favorite meal there, and you're never heard of places of this, to go. Oscar. I, I get the uh, – that's the blue cheese and stuff on it, and then it's got the crab, right? Uh, that you're black and blue covers the blue cheese. Yes. But, yeah, yeah the Oscar's just the crab The crab, top. The crab, lump crab yep. sauce on top. I, my favorite thing there is that a chicken cordon bleu, because I can't get it anywhere, and it's really good, and they have jalapeno cheese grits that they serve with it. No, yes. Fucking oh, my gosh, world. the jalapeno grits are awesome. Yes. Yep. But that's me and Michelle's favorite. We could, we'll eat there – I don't know, we – if we go to Abilene three times, we'll eat there at least once while we're there. And a lot of times we – <clears throat> now, we're old, we, so we can do the blue hair special a lot of times. Not that the price is any cheaper because I don't think it is, but we'll go eat at 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock a lot of times. And, you know, and there's nobody in there. But I love it. It's a great place to eat. And their drink there, the uh, creek water, yep, is very good. Yes. Mm. Justin Hill, love him to death, my little buddy, my little buddy. My little buddy. Little, little, little Gilligan down there in Hass County. Anytime I have a birthday or anything, he always gives me a Copper Creek gift card. He's such a sweet guy. I'm he telling is. you right now. He he's is. a nice guy. He's, he likes to th- act tough around the edges and rough, but he's he's a pretty kind-hearted dude. He, he's a very good-hearted person. Justin Hill's one of the nicest men I know. I mean, he really would do anything to help anybody. Now, if you don't help yourself, he ain't got a lot of use for your ass. Bingo. And, you know, let's let's just be honest. He's just making up for being as ugly as he is. <laughs> the dude, yeah. The dude, I mean, he wasn't blessed. His wife must have cataracts. Got to. 
Got yeah. to. Why the one eye can't see out the other? Has he ever told you the story about uh, when when they went skiing and and he got mistaken as her dad? <laughs> <laughs> no. So you, you just you just bring your daughters out here. Or? <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> oh. Oh. Wink, Cradle wink. robber. Mother, yeah, yeah. Motherfucker wink, must wink. have a lot of money. That's, that's right. <laughs> We're only six months apart, you asshole. They can't have deep pockets because they wouldn't hit the ground because he ain't very tall. <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, last night we were talking, and we were talking about uh, how waterfowl finds itself in this, waterfowl hunting finds itself in this interesting position where people are learning off of YouTube, yep. basically. They're not learning from dad and grandpa like they did a generation ago and nobody has ever taught etiquette and i believe that because the shit that we have to spell out for our young guides a lot of etiquette is really common sense but i think a lot of these kids they just don't have that common sense Mm -hmm. so if there was ever a way that somebody could find the proper balance of a good pile a good pile a good shoot and like also not being an asshole hunter, I think that's what the world is looking for right now. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier with like just barreling off through the middle of somebody's field that they told you not to drive in. You know you're not supposed to drive in it, yep. but you do it anyway. So this is something that I've often, I've often wondered about is am I doing a good job on Instagram getting away from the pile pics and maybe showing the lifestyle a little bit more but i don't know like you said you quit posting pile pics and you lost 2500 followers so i i don't know how we i don't know how we advance the younger generation and show them the proper way of doing things yeah and it's tough because you you don't get that gratification just from hearing a story typically you know right. for most people you have to be in the moment you know like the the field duck hunt we just had on our freelance trip you know I'm, my gosh can you imagine you know, how many how many ducks you could have shot at them had, had you, you know, wanted to go to town on them when they were sitting there in the decoys, five, seven, ten thousand ducks strong. I mean, it, it would have been insane, but but you you don't, and you get that, that feeling of, of just, I don't want to get too cheesy, but, you know, kind of sharing an, an intimate uh, natural experience. Right. And, you know, it's something that you don't get the same feeling about when you just hear about it. You know, unless you've been there, you don't really know. And I, I feel like a lot of it is getting these young hunters um, some of that experience and, or, or just some sort of direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we, we, that was the sitting there in that moment <coughs> of however many thousands of ducks were there. I mean, that's exactly what we busted our ass to do, you know. So that was just that, like that, that was ultimate it. gratification of just like, okay, cool. This, this now is what we, we came can, here to do. Now we can we can enjoy this and then you know we can shoot a couple after you know bingo but i don't it, but that doesn't sell like everybody just wants oh yeah 60 uh, birds uh, i mean kills it, it sells on right instagram right now and it's it's a it's a very very common practice across youtube is mm-hmm. that you know hey we shot a hundred and something birds right 100 or 87 birds and those are the ones that you know are the ones that's the ones that's getting the views mm-hmm. um so man there's like po- like the public land solo four-man mallard hunt is gonna get you know guys are gonna be like oh he shot four ducks so right. i'm not gonna watch that but yeah. meanwhile it's some of the most informative stuff <laughs> like the one video that forrest had is like extremely informative stuff he's talking about trolling ducks calling at ducks and and working them uh and then he even talks about getting in there early on public land i mean there's a lot of stuff that was very very informative that wouldn't necessarily have the amount of views as some guys that's got you know 176 birds dead you know? I, yeah i wish that and this would never happen anyways but i think it would be wonderful if everybody that has a a son or a daughter because we get more and more girls hunting we've had, we've had more ladies hunt this year than we did all of last year already and we're six days in we had a bunch of ladies this week that's fantastic that's awesome. it is and we need, if everyone would make someone, a young girl or boy that's wants to hunt, about 14 or 15 years old, read Nash Buckingham's books. Mm-hmm. Just for the simple fact of let them know what they're getting involved in and what it can be like. Because there's, it's, it's old people that enjoy the old antique decoys and stuff just because it's nostalgia and seeing it. But I've really, like, the, the young guys that work here now, every one of them is polite. 
Mm-hmm. We have a group, the, the most group, they were raised right. Yep. I don't know if it's because they were raised around hunting or what, but that, that they're all yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am. They're very polite young men. And hunters, we need more of that. Yep. Be polite, be respectful, teach these young guys. Because um, Lee Cho said something to me the other day that made a lot of sense. He said, you know, I'm finding really that a lot of the young guys, we make fun of the flat build guys, are really pretty respectful kids. They you just can, need they're, to be. They're, they're receptive. Like if you were to tell, we, we use the analogy of like an old smoker. If you were to tell an old smoker, hey, like, could you not do that around me? He'd be like, fuck you, it's free air. But if you were to tell like a younger generation smoker, like, hey, do you mind doing that? They're more receptive to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem at all. I'll move. So when you tell a younger generation, a younger guy, they take information a lot easier than a 35 or a 40-year-old waterfowl hunter that's been doing it this way for 20 years or something like that. So And that and I thought that was a, a valid point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like it's just part of the generation. It's, I, frankly, a lot softer, <clears throat> which not to say there's anything wrong with that in that circumstance, you know, it, but then again, it may be that same issue that, like we talked about, uh, lacking competitive nature or drive, you know, that maybe it's it's the same root cause there. You know, it's, it's tough to... You, you want to have a nice balance in there. I'm not saying we want assholes by any means, but, mm-hmm. you know, I'd kind of like someone who's, you know, got a little fire and, you know, be respectful and be polite. And, you know, maybe maybe the next day I'll go show up to public two hours earlier and get mm-hmm. in there. We need more alpha males in the world. Yes. And I'm not talking about the kid that was born on third base that thinks he hit no. a triple, as I no. say. We need more. Could you imagine, think about this right now, <clears throat> today's youth. 18-year-old kids. Could you imagine our country putting those kids storming the beaches of Normandy? I was yeah. just going to say it. You, if, <clears throat> if, God forbid, something happens and we get some, you know, World War Three going on, the the way that our draft would look, mm. I'd, I'd just about give up. Put the transgenders over here. Put this over here. Put, fuck that. I want a guy. I want the kid that's a jackass in town. I want the little asshole that's out poaching, that's out fucking drinking beer and and, and, and doing stupid shit that I would have done when I was a kid. And I wasn't a poacher, but you know what I'm talking yeah. about. That little, little Johnny that's a horse's ass, yep. that's the one I want fighting for my country. Yeah. Yep. I don't want the little fucker that don't know which bathroom to go into. Yep. And the problem is there's not very many little Johnnies left. And we look down at little Johnny because he's a jackass. And he's probably white typically yeah little white jackass kid yep. in town is the kid that we look down at. i mean yep. we've we've got a little johnny that works here but he's a short mexican kid gabriel but he's an all-american kid he likes to ride around in a truck he likes to hunt he likes to do everything i like to do as a kid you know fast women some, yeah fast women big women too, big women like. thick thighs, thick thighs save lives, save lives. Found out. <laughs> but those are the kind of kids we don't have very many of them i would have faith if they sent gabriel to storm the beaches of normandy but that was the kid. 90% of all the men were like that growing up in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. When I grew up in the 70s, we were probably at about 75% of the guys were like that. Fuck, now you're lucky to find 20% of the guys that have that shit. I yeah. think that'd be optimistic. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And that's I mean, sad. We've got people. I wonder what percentage of young kids, especially young young guys, are uh, you know getting diagnosed with ADHD and anxiety and all this other mm-hmm. stuff. Man, that's just... I'm not saying that there aren't genuine problems out there that need to be addressed for folks, but I don't think medicating our youth is the best way to no. move forward and, and, you know, continue to be the greatest country in the world. No, let me tell you about anxiety. Anxiety's fucking up and your dad having hands the size of a fucking bull, a bear and fucking slapping you on your ass for doing something wrong. That's Bingo. anxiety. That's life. That's right. That's that's yeah. knowing you yeah. screwed up. You get in trouble at school for popping a girl's bra and someone calls and you get your ass beat by your dad when you get home. Or he says, does she have nice tits? You know, you never know what's going to happen, but... <laughs> Those, though we don't have that no more. My, I got two grandsons at this lodge that get raised at this lodge. They hear everything that we talk about, they hear about, which is probably not always good, but they know the difference between right or wrong. They go to church all the time. They got two good parents and stuff. One of them is the sweetest kid in the world, got the nice heart. My youngest grandson, we should name his ass beef jerky because he's still going to be tougher than shit. <laughs> um, there, there's an interesting study. Well, it's not really a study, but <clears throat> kids that lack – uh, rough and tumble play before three years old, boys especially, their uh, brain doesn't develop. So they are more likely to later on in life be diagnosed with ADHD. Wow. Or wear a dress. So there's a direct correlation between, like, a kid being tossed around by his dad, you know, in a playful manner, and brain development, which, if that's not in place, Whenever they become teenagers, their prefrontal cortex doesn't develop, and then you can treat that deficit with uh, Ritalin. 
Damn. Are you are you any of y'all younger brothers or all older? I'm right? the youngest. Youngest. So yeah. you got the shit beat out of you growing up. Yeah. And that was good for you. Yeah. It's nothing bad about that. What about you? <clears throat> Only brother. child. You older got an older brother? No, so I, I am. Well, yes. You're I, the older I, one. I have an older brother who scared the living piss out of me as a kid. Yeah. I mean, that's part yeah. of it. It you is. Know? It is. Me it's and scary. Tony fought. When when we were little, I remember my dad, and if he was alive still, he'd tell you this story. My mom called him crying at the fire station one time. I was probably eight, and Tony was six. And she's like, oh, my God, Ronnie, I don't understand. All they do, they hate each other. They fight all the time. They're punching right now. I've spanked them three times a piece a day. What are we going to do? He said, nothing. They're fucking boys. They're supposed to fight. They're brothers. Yep. We grew up fighting and competing at everything we did. Well, our boys competed. It don't matter what we played. My, grandki- my grandkids, my granddaughter, same way. I make them compete. When Landon gets old enough, she's going to compete. I make them compete. All, everything we do is a competition. I think it's good for kids. I don't but that's disagree. the way I was raised. Yeah. I don't disagree. I mean, honestly, just, just looking at how you live life, you know, you don't have to judge yourself and, and, you know, determine your life in general as a success or a failure based on, you know, the difference between first and second place. But if you're not striving to be the best at what you do, why are you doing it? Why that's are right. you wasting your time? You know, if you don't have any desire to go out there and be the most successful at something, there's no point. Yeah, there's no shame in being second. No. The only shame is not trying to be better. Exactly. I had an old guy in town. There used to be twin brothers that owned a gas station in town. And he told me one time, I I used to, I I like older people. Now I'm older fucking people are about dying that I know, but now I'm the old person. But when I was 30 years old, I would go to the the gas station and a bunch of old men would sit outside and I'd go up there sometimes and sit and visit with them. And they were all World War II generation guys Mm -hmm. to Korean War. Well, I'd like to listen to their stories and talk and stuff. And the old guy told me one time, he said, you know, Jeff, he goes, there's no shame in being poor at all. He goes, the only shame is staying poor. And I, and I thought, you know, that's there's a lot to say about that. Yeah. That's true, yeah. you know. But <clears throat> and like we were saying last night, like nobody wants to take their lumps anymore. Mm-mm. Like nobody wants that ass spanking. And then because <clears throat> we get a lot of the same messages. Like somebody will send a screenshot of the field that they're hunting in and, and like I've got this wind and the birds are here and like where should I hide and – you made an interesting point. Like, it's almost like they want the blame to be taken off of their shoulders. Yes. Like, let me ask him, and then if it doesn't work out, well, Kyle Jones said I should put my A-frame right there and I should run a J-hook spread. It didn't work, so it's not my fault. It's Kyle's fault. Yep. Even though Kyle hadn't even seen the field, he's just going off of what you said. Mm-hmm. So it, it's almost like people just want, you know, they want everything so much easier, and they don't want to have to feel that failure. And that could also tie in back to why we're not seeing calling contests. Yeah. You know, why why is the decline in calling contests? Well, it's because nobody wants to get their ass spanked. Nobody wants to look at themselves as I just wasn't good enough that day. Yeah, and that, and that's the biggest thing is when it comes to 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 hunting and when it comes to calling or you know calling competitions. Like, man, these best these best guys that are like a, a Sean Stall. Mm-hmm. I would never want to set up. In a field across the street from a Sean, a guy like Sean Stahl, he's, he's a killer. He yeah. is a killer, and but I can guarantee you, he's had a lot of shutout days, and he's learned his yeah. ass off in the field. And that's the same thing with with all these hunting situations. You got to learn, man. Yeah. And you got to take the zero days. You got to take the one bird days. You got to watch those birds literally just go on a beeline, play follow the leader, land across the field. Mm-hmm. And uh, same thing with contest calling. We never started, you know, winning. We, we right we got how long did you go before you won your first um like good contest it was about i mean it was about a year but it was what about you yeah i'd say about a, about a year before a year? I, yep started that's a long time it. yeah yeah but it was practice i mean i i blew my call every day for two to three hours i didn't have a life when <laughs> i was 16 17 yep. 18 years old i was like but that's what it took exactly Bingo. Just what you did. But when you get better, you want to stop getting your ass kicked to get better. Yeah. yeah, I I quit I quit baseball to competition call, and I was extremely competitive in that. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, okay, well, I went from getting coached in one sport to getting coached in another. You just got you literally say, okay, yes, coach. Yeah. You know that's what you have to do, uh, and that's and the kids that are winning right now, that's exactly that's what, their attitude. That's exact. Luke White, two thousand, he won. 2018, 2019 Junior World Goose Calling Championship told him, this is what you need to do. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Next time, this is what you need to do. Okay. 
and he's winning. Or he he won. Nothing comes easy. No, no, no. no, no there's no. no free lunch in the world. Nothing comes easy. You got to work for everything you get. Absolutely. Now, some people have more natural talent. There's yep. no doubt about it. I yep. mean, <clears throat> LeBron James, if he was six foot three, probably wouldn't be in the NBA. Nope. But he, he was blessed with that talent. Mm -hmm. But he also has worked, and I'm not a LeBron James fan, but the guy has to be a hard worker, too. Absolutely. Be good. They just had an earthquake hit in um, Missouri. Really? Yeah. Yep, at Cape, uh, Cape Girardeau area. I just saw it. Josh sent me that, and I looked it up, 4.0. That's that, the biggest earthquake we ever had in the country was there in, um, I want to say, the early 1900s, and it was so bad that the Mississippi River ran backwards for two days. That's not good because that's right on the fault line right yeah, there. That's, that's right, at New Madrid. Yes. And, that's, and they just had one that hit, and it's 4.0. But what's bad is last time it went bad, they had three or four days of these like this, and then yep. they got the big one. Yep. And that's how Real Foot Lake was formed. That's right. And they yeah. just they just had because one because it, it, it flowed backwards and then yep. over yeah. the yep. the spillway and it's four point but it was a four point oh and it just hit just now but it was at New Madrid damn and they said they you could feel it within a hundred miles they said of St Louis there was one last night though too that's what they're starting to hit now there and that's oh what they're, they're worried about it being another big one would hit that's can you imagine in, our, in today's times if the Mississippi River flowed backwards for two days all those barges mm -hmm. it'd be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And we have Joe Biden leading us. It's so hard right. enough to get product as it is. Could you imagine all the barges say, yeah. Yeah. We got loaded Joe, with stuff? We got Joe Biden leading that yeah. charge this, and then a bunch of beta males. Let's just go ahead and say it now. Fuck Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, go hold on. You, you guys didn't hear this. This is all a Trump setup, okay? He yeah. left this for Joe Biden to, yeah. to inherit. This yeah. is this is he Trump's this earthquake, is be okay? Yeah. <laughs> what a bunch of fucking Freaking morons. People. The worst thing, the best thing happened in our country is we got rid of the news media. They're the it biggest would. machine. It really yeah, would. Two days ago, I do not watch any news at all. Very unless I walk through the room and it's on. I've got. I live with Dan Rather, Michelle. She's all a fucking Q lady, so I have to hear all about that stuff every night, anyways. But the the View the other day, they had a lady on Jedediah Smith, I think is her name, and she's a conservative pundit, and she she outlined why vaccine mandates don't work. Them ladies cut her off. Yeah. yeah, and she gave the, him science. The Dude. view is the view is one of the worst oh, shows I've yeah. ever seen. I don't seen. know anybody it's watches disgusting. it. Disgusting. Whoopi Goldberg is is yeah. a nightmare. You know why? Because those women don't get any dick. <laughs> Every one of them. <laughs> those are penis free women right there. <laughs> Not only are they unattractive looking, but they like they don't like dick. I don't think Even, and none of them. They're bitter at it. But that's right. That's right. They, that's exactly right. Yep. They have penis envy. Every one of them. Yep. But that's the problem. They need some dick on that show. The girls at Fox News they get laid all the time. They're happy all the time. And if they're not getting laid, it's by their choice. It's not because people don't want to screw them, because there's a lot of people that would. Because whoever's hiring that eye candy at that place has got it going they, on. They got some good-looking women oh, that work at Fox News. I'm telling yeah. you. But I, I'm, I'll watch both on purpose just to see how skewed it is. I don't do it it's anymore. A totally different story. It's totally. I, I did listen to MSNBC in my truck coming home after the Virginia election just to listen to them fuckers whine and make excuses. Yep. And the best one was, this has nothing to do with Donald Trump. He's not important anymore. Did yep. you see the seventy some million people that truly voted for him? Uh, they haven't left. <laughs> do you I'm, see I'm telling you the best thing that Donald Trump did was show people that you don't have to be a politician mm -hmm. to fix things. And common I think sense. Politicians are, are the biggest problem in this country right yes. now. The number one problem. Con, con, politicians should not be celebrities. No. When I grew up, the Speaker of the House was Tip O'Neill. And I knew that because I did read. I grew up, I, I read a lot anyways. I always have, and I've been interested in stuff. So I was always up with modern times. Even when I was a little kid, I read a lot. But the average person couldn't have told you who the Speaker of the House was. They damn sure couldn't tell you senators from different states. And that now everybody knows who Joe Manchin is. Yeah. Nancy uh, Pelosi, everybody. Yep. I'm sick of watching them walk around and, and, and be, you know, flaunted just like you see it, like celebrities. Mm -hmm. They work for us. Yes. And I'm sick of them feeling like rulers you because know, they need to have the carpet pulled out from underneath them, remind them, hey, maybe maybe you shouldn't be voting on your own salary. Maybe you ought to make about what everybody else makes. Uh, and then remember that you're doing a duty for us and try to fix this stuff so we can all get our lives back together. Politicians were designed to be successful people to go to Washington, D.C. for a month that they could leave their farms or their yep. businesses and it could be taken care of and go there and make decisions based on you would make for your own personal business. It wasn't meant to be a profession. No. And, and we've gotten away from that because if you did that now and you said, you know, we don't pay, they, they need to quit paying them and you only they should do. be able to spend X amount of dollars on campaigning. Yep. You would have people like Donald Trump running the bit, and that's who I want running. Mark Cuban, I can't stand the guy, but at least he would have been better president than Joe Biden because he has business sense. Yes, yep. you know, yeah. uh, you know what the you know what the messed up part is. You were just talking about how we treat polit politicians like celebrities, right? Mm -hmm. They make more, 
the oh, most yeah. celebrities. Oh, yeah. And that's more. what's fucked it's up. It's 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 terrible. And it's uh, and they make one hundred seventy thousand dollars a year. How do you accumulate fifty to hundred million dollars? They showed a deal on Nancy Pelosi. All the bi- all the stock trades her husband's made in the last two or three years. Yep. All stuff. Bought a bunch of Tesla when they knew they was going to do this electric motors yeah. and shit. It's just crazy. Yep. And the best thing ever was when Elon Musk the other day come out and they on this. You know, you shouldn't have that much money. And he offered, they said he could solve the world's hunger problems. Yep. I'll sell $6 billion worth of stock, mm-hmm. but you're going to show me where you're going to yep. spend every dime. Show me they don't want no part of that shit. Yep. Anybody else would have said, hey, you take a preacher to small town, and if some church, some guy like him said, hey, we'll pay enough money to fix whatever the problem is, you just got to show us transparency where it's been. Yes, sir, we appreciate that so much. We're going to show you where all that money went. Yep. They don't want his money because they don't want everybody to show them, see the corruption. Yeah. No. Well, like, I mean, it's they blame Elon Musk for having so much money, but look at how many people he employs. Mm-hmm. They don't right? ever see that. Hey, man, like, wh- why should he be? Why should he be uh, scrutinized for busting his ass to make him s- to make the money that he's made? Yep. You know, yep. he did something with his life. Shell exactly. Oil Company. They always want to bitch about the big oil companies. How many fucking jobs does Shell Oil Company are they? Are, do they do they produce? And you tax the shit out of it. You tax it when it comes out of the ground. You tax it when they put it in a car. They tax it when someone drives. I mean, they tax the shit out of that. The government should be happy as hell we have Shell Oil Company, or they wouldn't have all the fucking money to blow that they blow. Yep. But they, but then Apple goes, and how much is a cell phone? How much do you think that cell phone cost to make? That, $15? That cell phone right there, probably. More than that. Probably, I would go between like 30 to $35. Okay, let's say it's $100. Yeah. And they sell that phone for $1,000. Uh-huh. How much cheap labor in China is made into making that phone? Not a whole lot. You don't think so? I think that's Chinese labor right there. Oh, yeah. No, that's a so, cheap Chinese so labor. So it's not like you're getting it built in the Silicon Valley mm-hmm. or in Omaha, Nebraska. That phone's being built in somewhere in Taiwan or Japan or somewhere at cheap labor. Yep. But they this don't ever bitch about Apple. $49 for an iPhone 8. But this also says fourteen hundred dollars for the highest end iPhone Max. But they're only selling it for a thousand dollars. It don't cost them fourteen hundred dollars to build that phone. They're not losing. No, they're, they're not, not going to lose penny. money. But it does for for a basic iPhone. It costs around fifty bucks. And it, it's such good technology. They can turn it down when it gets to when you need a new phone. So you'll have to go buy a new one. Yep. And fuckers are smart. And I don't have nothing against them. That's just like the guy that owns Amazon. I'm fucking. I'm jealous of him. Yeah, I mean, here's a guy that could afford to give his wife $30 billion, and he still has a place to live. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's done really well for himself and has a great business model. You know, so I don't we, – we, we, It goes we, back to what we were saying. Like, we, we, we demonize the people that are super successful. Mm-hmm. Like, why should you guys have all these world titles? Yeah, because it's I got off fair. my ass and practiced and learned how to blow a freaking goose call, and that's what kills me about, you know, just the attack that we see on capitalism today. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely disgusting to uh, you know, to, to give people a hard time for working their ass off to be better, yeah. and yeah, it's not that they necessarily want to be better than you. It's just that they want to be successful. They they want to stop being poor. Yeah, you know, it, and it's at every level. I mean, I'm a poor guy. I'll never have a lot of money because I like to spend money, but and I'll never have a bunch of money. And and, and I'm I, I like I love my life. I live a good life. But I'm employing almost 20 people here. Mm-hmm. You know, we got 20 people working because me and Tony started a damn outfitter a long time ago. Well, we're a small minute deal. We've got a guy in town that owns a propane company that hires all kinds of people that's done really good for himself. Well, if he wasn't doing that, a lot of people around our area wouldn't have jobs. Mm-hmm. we got farmers that – I've got two neighbors that work for, on our farm for a guy that he's he, – he didn't grow up farming 10 or 15, 20,000 acres. They built that hard and done it themselves. And that's what America's made of, and they want to get rid of all of that shit. Well, that's the jobs people have. And if, if you want to work for me as a guy, that doesn't mean you can't start. You know, that old tree that we talked about, Tim Grounds, there's a big tree from people that have been around here that got their own outfitters and stuff now. And it happens in every business. Yep. Well, everybody's got a dream. you got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. But the America, now they want to take all that shit away from everybody and just give everybody some money to stay home. Yeah. That ain't fucking living. Do you know one person that's on any kind of government no. subsidies or anything that has anything more than a place to live and, a, and, a, and food to eat? Nope. And you know? no, and no sense of accomplishment or happiness. Yeah. Yeah. I have yet to be on vacation and visit with people next to me that say I live on welfare. Not one time. I haven't had one guy come in here and hunt that lives on what that's lives on welfare. You know, <laughs> not one yeah. person's come in here and says, "What do you do for a living?" Oh fuck, I get a damn check every month from the government. No, it don't happen. I got some guys that get Social Security check that they're getting fucked out of their money on. Yep. And that's me and Andy's big debate. Hey, Social Security's not going to go broke. Yes, it keep, is, Jeff. You know, no, they'll find ways. They'll, they'll print money. But that Social Security is the biggest thing in the world. It's the biggest fake thing in the world. By the time I get to, I've put three hundred thousand dollars in. By the time I retire, they're going to give me twenty two hundred dollars a month for the rest of my life. 
Woo hoo! Fucking that's so nice of you. Twenty thirty four, right there, Jeff. Yeah, they won't be out of money. They'll find a way to sub. They'll find a way to do it. We will run out of money. Oh, twenty thirty five. We got okay, We got an extra year. Though. So I got fourteen years. I am fifty three. So I would be sixty seven. So I'm gonna take my money at sixty two, so I can get five years of my twenty two hundred dollars a month or whatever they're gonna give me back. Man, that's that, that's gonna make you feel real good. And it? it's I'm not counting on that money. No, I mean I would like you, to you have can. it. You can't. No. I mean, especially like my wife and I, we've discussed that, and we are you know we're trying to save and, and take care of our own retirement ourselves because that I'm kind of so you, you don't think don't, it's gonna be think there. It's either. gonna be there. No, there's not a shot in hell. Oh, I think it would. It's, they've been running out of money for 50 years. No, Jeff. Well, if they don't, it's going to run out. Well, you may have to take care of me and mom. We're taking. We're, we're paying people too much money because we've robbed Peter but, to pay Paul but, for too long. But the people that are getting paid in Social Security are not getting their money back. My wife's dad passed away before he ever took a dime out of Social Security. He paid for 40 years into Social Security. Let's say he paid in $200,000. How many people like him are out there? How many people die that are in their 50s or 40s that have paid in? They don't ever get a dime. It's a it's the biggest bunch of bullshit ever. But now we're going to give $450,000 to illegals for coming over here and breaking the law. Mm. Mm, mm, I'm thinking mm. about crossing the border over to China and see what they'll give me for a check. I bet you they ain't going to give me shit but put me in prison. Yeah, try, try going into North Korea, see how that goes. Yeah. Probably, probably be pretty good, too. Can you imagine the dating life over there for them oh guys? Oh, my God. I had a, I had a we had a Muslim guy here. We had a group from Saudi Arabia here one time, and it was very. They put the old they rolled the old rugs out and shit. And did at, I, 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 at sunrise they did. They asked me if it would be okay to pray. I'm like, oh, who's gonna keep you from you that? Yeah, yeah. Go it's ahead. America. It's America, but yeah. Do so it. so they did. They old rug came out. They up and down, and um, I had to lend out my gun that morning, which I was not a fan of. So I had. Uh, it was funny. I didn't trust them. So I took the Magic Mike, like, end piece that's got the stakes in it, and I put that, like, <laughs> next to me. Take a gun. They, gun took my nut. they took my gun away. Take a knife to a gunfight. Because they, they couldn't fly over here with guns, so they like, borrowed all of our guns. And um, There was a corporate trip that guy booked to hunt for these guys and did not tell us nothing was going on. Yeah. I mean, it was and they were it was during Ramadan. Yeah. yeah. Or I think so they didn't the one, eat. They didn't want to eat nothing but. Bread and water. Yeah. Yeah, I but I did. Know. I had that end of that magic mic thing, and I just set it right beside me. And I'm like, if these fuckers try something, I'm gonna get one of them at least. They might get me in a rush. <laughs> felt like I felt like what was it, wider? You might get me in a rush, but I'm gonna make your friend's head into a canoe. So I, I'm gonna beat the fuck out of I you. I have to ask questions because I'm a curious person. Yeah. So I asked the one dude that had no, his eyes were black, soulless eyes. I'm telling you. Sit and talk to me. Had a whole pistol cock sitting at my old desk. See there, you were nervous too. So don't give me shit. And uh. Check and make sure he didn't have his suicide vest on. I was looking <laughs> shit. The fuckers have been reading my Facebook. They're going to blow me up. So I tell the guy, I go, I want to ask you a question about your religion. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I go, how many wives do you have? How the fuck's that multiple wives? Because that just fascinates me. I've got one wife, and she's a pain in the ass sometimes. I can't imagine having three or four of them suckers. And you know everybody's pissed off at Valentine's Day. I mean, you can't do nothing right. Yep. And he's like, oh, I, I only have one wife. But my, my dad, he has three or four wives. Like, that's got to be weird. So then we're talking. I said, well, how do y'all date and stuff? And this is what this guy tells me. He said, well, if we go to a, a club or somewhere, you know, they're not allowed to have alcohol or nothing. And they see a lady that interests them. They have a room in the back where they can take the room and they have the women disrobed to see if they like them. I thought, these fucking Muslims are onto some shit here now. I'm telling you. <laughs> go ahead and take your clothes off and spin around. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. But it they, was the weirdest fucking deal. Then they, they come in to see me one day and I was like, uh, they was here for three days. I go, do y'all want to do an afternoon hunt? He goes, I think we're going to go to that car show. I go, huh? It's like on a Wednesday. I go, what car show? We saw it in that little town by here. And I'm thinking, on a Wednesday? What the fuck's happening? I'm thinking at car show, you know, antique cars and stuff. Right. I go, what are you talking about? He said, oh, that showcase. I go, I, I don't follow what you're talking about. He goes, you know, the, the building's got all the trucks. I said, a car lot? Yeah, 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 yeah. Them fuckers went and bought three King Ranch trucks with <laughs> cash. And had them taken to Houston to put on a boat to ship to Saudi Arabia because they couldn't buy King Ranch Fords over there. Put them on a container ship. Yeah. Damn. Couldn't believe it. I said, boy, there's going to be a happy fucking salesman there. He's yeah. going to see these fucking guys get out of this fucking rental van, and then he's going to think, oh, fuck, I ain't wasting my time with these dudes. Yep. And the dude's going to pop down $160,000 on his desk in cash to buy these trucks or whatever it costs. Yep. They were buying, so they went to New York after they came here, and they were buying, like, lots, like, abandoned buildings. That's what they did. They were part of the royal family over there, yeah. and they were just, you know, tons of money. The guys, in Manhattan is what yeah, they would do. And the head, the head 
the head chief camel guy was uh, from Saudi Arabia or somewhere. I mean, he was from he went to school at Berkeley or Stanford or something. Mm-hmm. And they, they were just man. He he used to be on my Instagram. I think I pissed him off. I made a couple of suicide vest jokes, and I don't think he's on there anymore. But his his name was like thirty seven letters of all kinds of shit. I don't know what they were. But I looked one time, and it was him. Yeah, but just yeah. a different cat. Yeah, y'all miss that at dive bomb, don't you? Getting to hunt people like that. Man, I remember I had a group like that that insisted on cutting the throat of every goose that we killed. What? They didn't do that? No. <laughs> it wasn't kosher, I guess, or whatever the hell. They cut the throat of every bird that y'all shot? Man, I mean, I'm telling you, we were shooting them close. We were in the spread. They were doing it right. And, yes, every throat had to be slit. It was it, it weirded me out, honestly. Do they have like a special knife, or like they would just pull out the, their pocket knife and bust out the old ginsu? Pr- pretty much whatever they had. Yep. Holy yep. cow! Maybe. That's crazy. What a weird religion. I mean, the, the whole well, religion is based on hating other people. It seems like it. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not well versed on it, so I'm, you know, I, I try not to. Yeah. But they've all know, it, all it religions have kind of have their quirks. Definitely, but man, it, a lot of stuff that seems really confusing to me. There's yeah. nothing in their religion that says love thy neighbor or turn the other cheek. It's cut his throat and kill him. Yep. I mean, and, and I don't know. I, I've, I've had, we have a couple of Muslims that hunt this year, uh, every year with us. We had a, a guy that was here last year, owned a bunch of gas stations in Dallas, and he was a really a nice, nice man. But just, I don't, I don't trust them. You know, and and I don't I've not had none for neighbors, and I'm sure there's some nice peaceful people, but everything that comes down in their religion is that you know it's yeah that's that's the thing you know I've never I've never met a Muslim person that I didn't think was a nice person mm-hmm. yeah but you just look at the building blocks of what's defining moral fiber, and the definition of right and wrong can kind of be pretty pretty gray and skewed there in a lot of places and it, i think uh, i understand you know why yeah. i feel that way the the, the the democratic party embraces them for votes but they stand against everything the democratic party with the, all their oh, yeah. uh, the way they're supposed to i can't what's the inclusion of everybody acceptance you know? of, yeah except yeah. but th- they throw gay people off of roofs they the women shouldn't fucking vote drive do anything they should be covered up all the time no, get stoned yes yeah. and mm-hmm. then you got aoc and them all up there propping them well, lady you couldn't even live in saudi arabia you'd be someone's fucking slave you know that's what you would be yeah and, and you'd be a blowjob queen for them but now here but you're going to talk about how we need to be more like them and shit Fuck, screw that a bunch yeah. of weird dudes so did you have to uh process the bird in a, in a special manner also or just nope they just it? Slid it, and that's good at, enough. At, at the end, they just cut all their throats. It wasn't even like an as it was happening kind of thing. It was like, you know, birds have been pretty cold and stiff for a couple hours now, and they cut the throats. All right. <laughs> you really got them. Weird dudes, boy, I'm telling you. Weird, <laughs> weird, Good weird. job there. But this right. motherfucker would have bopped out with an old kabuki sword and we'd be doing dancing around there. Fucking Andy had been hightailing that shit out of that fucking oh place. Bad. <laughs> it would have been bad. Because we, I didn't know about or we were – we the spread was out and i said hey go grab all your gear whatever you're gonna need blah 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 uh where are our shotguns i'm like where are they like are you playing with are you playing a joke on me like i don't know what you did with your shotguns he's like we couldn't fly over with them you we thought you were going to provide us shotguns to call jeff we never provide guns that would have been a great discussion last night yeah, yeah. they didn't get come in late call jeff and uh i'm like hey these guys don't have guns i've got my shotgun that i can give them and uh so jeff rounded up some shotguns here and then they bitched that they weren't benelli's yeah there was satori over unders so we took them some more over unders he goes well uh, do you not have any benelli's i don't shoot benelli's (laughs) i shoot over unders so we took them three over unders andy gave him his gun there was only like four or five of them and i took whatever we had I, i had enough satori's for all of them and took them stories I'm old school. I like Satori. I think they're very good guns. I, I'm not a. I don't like shooting automatics, anyways. But that guy was like, "Well, we want a Benelli's." Well, listen, motherfucker, you should have fucking <laughs> left them, got them under, out from under your fucking camel over in Rehod or wherever the fuck you are, and not be an asshole about it. Or that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars you just were going to spend on right. trucks, spare yeah a dime or two and go buy, you go a, buy a shotgun. He, yep. he he told me he said if we come back next year, if if we if I wire you the money, could you buy some guns for us? I was like, yeah, I don't give a shit. And I thought, whoa, whoa, hold on. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> That might not be such a bad, idea, a good idea, you know. You might be shooting up a fucking Denver airport or some shit. So, yeah. but they were, they it was very unnerving. Or he was just trying to, he was just trying to loop you into giving you 
some bank account information, you know, like the. He would be really disappointed if he was trying to get money out of my account. <laughs> it would be the opposite end. I'd be getting his account. I'd be happy as hell. You know, he'd be like, hey, he go. And what, he was a tight ass, too, is what's funny. He went to tip. I thought, well, this is my first going to tip good for everybody. And boy, he was fucking down to the nickel, you know. Twenty dollars here, five dollars here. And that was they it. They were here for two days, and I told Jeff, "I'm like, I'm not hunting them by myself tomorrow. We're doubling up. Yeah. Okay, where we got to go? For, there's gonna be two guides out there and some witnesses to whatever they try to do. I'm sitting in the truck with a thirty odd. Because this was when like all the <laughs> all the beheadings and stuff were going on over oh, there, yeah. and I'm like, that's the last thing I need. Goose guide in West Texas, head cut off. I'd be all over the Al Jazeera network or whatever the hell. I'm like, this is not gonna. Be Michelle good. is all upset and worried about it. I said, Michelle. <clears throat> Why would they waste time on a small family in Noxie, Texas? To let them know that they can get to anybody, Jeff. That would strike the fear in every goose hunter (laughs) around. That's what they're trying to do. Just create pandemonium and and spread fear. That's how it would do it. And four of them had the same fucking first name, Muhammad, or some shit, too, you know. Well, that's all of them. I'm Muhammad Salah, falafel, falafel, and the next guy, I'm Muhammad, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, goddamn, Mo, Mo, and Mo, and Mo. Mm. No good. No good. Um... We're going to have to do lunch here pretty quick. What? Uh, so you're in Haskell next. What's the rundown you guys got? Home you're for a couple days. Off for Thanksgiving? Uh, kind of. And then Stuttgart, Arkansas for the World Duck Calling. Are y'all contest. competing in that? Yep. yep. You are? Yep. Like everything is dialed in and ready to go? Yep. How long does that take? Like where you're like, I'm confident that I'm ready to go. I don't know. I mean. We, we get into all sorts of stuff of being a competitor and always feeling like you're the best in the game. But, uh, you know, you give me a week and a half of being able to blow two, three routines a day, I can feel pretty dialed in. One A week and a – ten days? Yeah. What yeah. about you? Ten days? Yeah, about the same. So, okay, so here's the thing that Trevor gets shit on is Trevor says he doesn't hardly practice. Yep. How much of it is truly like muscle memory? Like your routine, you're not changing it much. No, I'm not changing my routine at all. I know my routine. I know exactly what second I'm at mm-hmm. in my routine at that, you know, by where I'm at. Right. Uh, you know, so it, it, there is a lot of muscle memory. It's just, it, I mean, it's just like going and try to bench press 225 pounds for six times and you can only get three. But then, you know, you give it a couple of weeks, you're going to be able to get as you know the six or seven or eight or however many you want it um it's 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 a lot of just getting back in the rhythm of doing things because once you reach a certain level yeah there's a you know i personally i don't i don't believe (laughs) the right you know the blow 10 routines deal but it's just one of those or it's man it give it a couple weeks and you'll be back in yeah whether whether you're blowing your routines or just blowing your call it's all about getting back with lip strength getting your muscle yeah. memory going get your diaphragm moving and you know polishing up whatever has accumulated rust in the right. time that you've taken off how much time will y'all take off i mean we go hunting so that counts as practice right um what about in the off season do you ever go months without yeah there's I, i'm pretty sure from about the beginning of march to the end of turkey season neither one of us thinks about anything other right. than killing a turkey so the uh yeah. waterfowl calls definitely fall by the wayside yeah covid really 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 jacks some shit up like just because of every, the layover just because it's like man like there's not even anything to practice for right uh it, most of the time your comp- competition calling is done in between months of like august to november mm-hmm. right and i mean there was nothing to nothing to prepare for everybody was just like okay well we can't go to canada or anything like that there's no contests we'll just hunt around home nothing so that really kind of got I, w- I was trying to practice back in july because game fair was coming up mm-hmm. and um it was just after squad fest and i'm sitting there blowing my call I'm like jesus like i am whooped i'm out of shape <laughs> i am not i'm not in a good spot with my call and i yeah. was not confident at all um but you know you can get you can get right back into it within a couple of weeks i think yeah you know, and it depends how you hit it too yes. you know like i qualified for this world duck calling contest not last february but the february before so aside from um 
Steiny, who is the reigning world champion. I think I don't know if there's a another qualifier prior to the one that I competed in, so I'm probably the going on the second longest break from winning a contest and qualifying and then not being able to blow in another sanctioned contest until yeah. Worlds. So, so what are they doing? So 2019 you qualified yep. and then that's carrying over to, to this year? 2021, yep. Because they didn't have it last year. Yep, but but the rules are he if he would have gone and competed in a sanctioned calling contest, he would lose. I would have lost that bus ticket. Yep. So I could have either forfeited my – the, the contest that I already won along with the prizes and all that stuff. Uh, or I could, uh, you know, just, just kind of wear it and wait and wait and wait. So that's what I did. And luckily, you know, sometimes you pick up a call after a long time and, and it really sucks. Sometimes you pick it up and you're just, you know, firing on all cylinders. And it just felt really, really good from the get-go. And, you know, it's just kind of gotten better since. So how much stage time do you need optimally – to, to feel like you're ready to go? Or can you get that in practice just in your garage? You can never get enough. Honestly, yeah. really? I, I could I could blow in two contests every weekend for a month. So what is know, that? Uh, is it just, a, is it just your, your, like, how is that different than, than practice? Is it just because the stakes are higher? Or what, what do you get from contests that you don't get from just it's running It's for real. It? You know, it's, it's that feeling that we talked about last night, like being on the Easton stage. It's the... Right the pure fire of the adrenaline in your chest, knowing what's on the line, you know, uh, having a, having a couple Job's trophies is pretty awesome. You know, mm -hmm. that's a pretty, pretty big thing to compete for. Something I've wanted since I was uh, 12 years old was a duck call about this freaking big, you mm -hmm. know, to, to have, I want that world championship duck calling contest trophy and I want it bad. And every time that's on the line, man, I mean, it's, feels like wrestlemania let's let's get this thing on man let me let me give some dude a big old suplex and you know give me that dang trophy the nerves are uh, i mean if i didn't get nervous before the contest or after i go in the first or second or third round man i'm i'm not gonna contest call anymore because really? it's just like I so mean, you want to feel that oh yeah 20 so it's, it's the biggest rush you'll ever have 2019 world goose third round which is on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. So the first two rounds are on Friday, third round's on Saturday. Uh, before the third round on Saturday night, I was throwing up. I was I was like Coach Boone <laughs> and remember the Titans before yep. his first game, like just nervous. And then after you walk off stage, you go to try to drink water, and you're just sitting Hand there just – and, and every single person that walks off that stage is like that. And that's the cool – that's the cool part yep. is that it, everybody's – Everybody has that same exact rush. It's like shooting a 185-inch deer right. under your stand at 15 yards that you've been watching all summer. Yep. You've been growing them for the past four years. You know, it's yeah. it's a it is a very very cool feeling. Yeah. And Trevor says he doesn't feel nerves. What do you think? Oh, he's got to. You think so? I don't. I don't, I don't know how you couldn't. I don't Honestly, I don't know why you'd do it if you didn't. Yeah. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's there's a difference between harnessing that adrenaline and being controlled by it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't. I don't buy it either. Tell, I tell me what Hunter wouldn't. What Hunter would not feel a rush after pulling back on a 185 inch 185 inch whitetail at 15 yards underneath her stand. Heck, how, how about uh, how about you bring up Hunter? How about Hunter Grounds? Yes. Debatably, you know the best goose caller in the world will chew his fingernails down to the point where, I mean, you can hardly tell he has fingernails. Yeah. Just because he's that nervous. Other people would do that stepping into the same room to compete against him mm -hmm. yeah. but he's over there like bending his his fingernails off the nail bed to chew more because he's so nervous about it yep. and he has nothing to prove anymore either no. and he's already and, and he's every single at a time, 10 that's that's yep. that's what it, what happened nine i mean nine to eight times out of ten he blows clean he's probably winning the thing right probably winning the contest and he's still like that every single time I wonder if his reputation is what makes him that way. Is just because he feels like he has to be so much better than everybody else. Yeah. Like a weight on his shoulders. Type. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like every contest that he goes to, he knows he's going to get the rock star treatment. And he knows that when he walks down the alley, everybody's going to step aside and let Hunter go to the stage. So I wonder if that's kind of like, you know, you've got the title and yeah. everybody's expecting big things out of you. Uh, maybe more so – because there's a standard a standard that's been set right you know there's a standard of of win as a household winning name you mm -hmm. know it's just like tom brady he's right expected to win the super bowl he's expected to win you know yeah. it's kind of like one of those thought processes there 
And that's the thing with contest calling. It's like, it's on you. Oh, yeah. Like Tom Brady, he's, he's at least got, hey, my defense let me down. It's yeah. like, if you go up there and you shit the bed, yeah. well, you shit the bed. But, man, it, there is that. There's the competing against yourself. And then there's going up and doing exactly what you wanted. And panel yeah. judges just didn't, just didn't like yeah. you. Honestly, I mean, Kyle and I just did the, the team goose calling. Frankly, Dude. it was – Everything we dreamt of doing, and then some, and we got cut in the first round. Yeah. I blew, I blew the the best three routines at Worlds I've ever blown in my life. Really, at this past one, I didn't make it to the third round. And That's got us. It, oh, it's. I mean, it's like, damn, dude. Like, what? But, what more do I have to do? Yeah, yeah. but I mean, and then you could turn around, do the same exact thing in front of even two different judges, and oh yeah. have a completely different outcome. I hate contests that are. It's kind of like gymnastics in the Olympics, which yep. I do not watch, but. Someone else's opinion is what decides. It's not a clear yep. cut. You, you don't have a clear cut winner. Yep. Someone always can have an argument and say, "Well, that's not." Mm-hmm. That would that that's. I hate any sport like that. Yeah, I like something that keeps score. But I don't know. There's not a better way of doing. No, there's this. not an answer to do it. I'm just saying anything that's like that. And I just use gymnastics as an example. Anything you use someone else's diving, you use someone else's opinion on. Yep, is what you're doing because, like you said. You could have two different judges there, and it can be a whole different person who wins the same yep. thing. Yep. Yep. Because you lost the champion of champions by two points. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that's like just a stylistic thing? No, I messed up. Oh, you messed up? Yeah. In, the, in the third round and the second round. So, I mean, I, where'd you mess up at? Was um, it like the same spot each time? No, the first time was, um, well, kind of. They were they were like six seconds apart. So, like the first in the. In the first round, or the second round, I was coming down right before my comeback, and there's, like, two really soft rolling clucks that I do mm-hmm. that are, like, that are like really, really soft. Um, just trying to build that emotion up from the very, very bottom end. Mm-hmm. And it was right there. I didn't roll the cluck. It was just one more of, like, one sound. It's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. And then the um, in the third round, I was calling, and it was actually – a few seconds before that when I'm actually going about as fast as I can possibly go. And it was just like a, it wasn't a bobble, but it wasn't, and it wasn't a stick. It was just like a, like a pause. Like I kind of forgot where I was at mm-hmm. type deal just cause it was, I mean, it was a third round of champion of champions. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You got bright lights on you. You're wanting to win Yeah, and just lost myself. And it was a pretty, pretty apparent mistake. So, really? Yeah. I mean, he, you heard it, he heard it. I yeah. Mean, but it's, it, Again, it's one of those things that you hear that it's like, did he mess up? He, did, he, didn't, did he, do, he, didn't, he didn't do yeah. anything wrong, but yeah. you know, it, it just wasn't it wasn't didn't. right. You it's, know what I mean? It's one of those deals where like he knows my routine, my wife knows my routine, all my buddies know exactly what my routine sounds like, right. and they're like, that didn't sound right. Right. That didn't sound. You right. know, what's funny is ninety nine percent. Me and Justin actually talked about this today on the goose callers. <coughs> the guys that call that are really good, like. Uh, most of the guys that work as a guide, I'm gonna say 90 percent of the guys in the country that are guides that hunt all the time, they're good goose callers. Proficient. They're they're probably and in then, the upper. And, yeah. and and then you take half of them, and they're at the 99 percentile. It's that one percentile that y'all are blowing at compared to everybody else, and that most people don't get. I mean, there's yeah. just a one percent better. But there's not a big difference. There's no, there's a fine line between y'all and a really good caller. Yep. I mean, there's just a very it's it, and, and and that's what's amazing about that is it just to be that one percent. Yep, and and that's one thing that why we want, you know, we always encourage as many people to competition call as possible because there's there is that fine line that yeah. that a guy could easily jump, so it would be so so easy for some guys to just make that jump right up into that. But they got to put in the time exactly, and people don't want to exactly. put in. See, time. and I'm confident. Like j- somebody asked, I think it was Young Josh. What did y'all call? It was yesterday. Did y'all call? I'm like, well, yeah, I don't care. Like, I'm confident in what I've got. He's like, ooh, I don't, I don't know if I'd call in front of those guys. I'm like, why the fuck not? Yeah, it's the only way you're. Why get would better. you not do yeah. it? Two, he, two days in a row, my lanyard stayed in my blind bag because I was confident that what y'all were doing was right. enough to do what we needed to do. Oh yeah, yeah. didn't even cross my mind to pull my calls out. Absolutely. But he was. He was like, did you call in front of him? I'm like, Josh and I were like, well, why wouldn't we? Yeah. It's what, but, we're, what we're here but to the, do. The, they need to learn to call. You got to call. The only way you're gonna get better is to call. You go with me and with me in a blind and don't call. Well, you, you're not gonna get better calling around me because I can't call for shit. Mm-hmm. But when you get around somebody that can call, call. That's mm-hmm. you're only gonna make yourself better. 
Yep. You can learn more calling with someone that's professional that knows what they're doing than you can. E- even watching him learn how to blow a speckle belly call the past couple months has yeah. been nuts. Just from from being around me, from listening to other people, yeah. and to hear the progression that he's made, and not only learning how to how to blow the call, but learning how to work specs. I mean, working mm-hmm. specs is a different game than working sure. Canada's. Yeah. And I mean, on our freelance trip, you're pretty frustrated at one point or another trying oh, to work yeah. these stupid birds, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I I didn't call a whole lot for the specs on our freelance trip. Like I just didn't didn't do it because I I was like, well, I got Forrest with me, you know. I yeah. got a video camera. I'll watch Forrest do it, you know. Right. And no, I mean, I just I just picked up on what he was doing, and I try to mimic that, and you know, utilize it somewhere else. Twenty twenty five years ago, you couldn't hardly get a spec call. Yeah. Shanghai. Yep. Was Shanghai. The best yeah. call. The best call. All the coon asses had them. Yep. And that was it. I mean, I'm sure some other people had them. You just didn't know much it, about it, them. It was either that or it was a modified T20. You're right. I mean, that's, then, that's it. And then and now the Sandhill Crane calls the one that's coming. Everybody's starting to get Sandhill Crane calls. Yep. Yep. And it's crazy. After all those years, nobody had any of that shit. Which nobody could shoot Sandhill Cranes consistently till about 15 years ago anyways. I mean, let's be honest. There wasn't very many dudes, you know, that were doing it. And then now yep. everybody's watching the same videos and everybody's killing cranes. Yeah. And Dive Bomb has changed a lot of areas. Because guys can afford to buy five dozen, and your buddy it wears him out all the time because everybody's got a set of dive bombs now. Yep, yep. makes a yep. difference. All right, we got to get off this thing, Andy. guys. Thank y'all so much for sitting back down with us. They're getting lunch ready. Um, best of luck next weekend at uh, Stuttgart. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate Thank you. it. Have fun. fun. God bless. It's we look been, forward uh, to it. Hope y'all come back next year. It's we, been yeah, a, it's been be a pleasure here. with you guys. So we wish y'all the best. We'd love to have the varsity here again next year. Yeah, don't <laughs> don't send us the JV. Yeah, we need the varsity. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks, buddy. Bye. Go check out all of our great sponsors. Check out Dive Bomb Industry, Shin Gear Waiters, Steak Plains Meats, Pacific Calls, Boss Shot Shell, Dirty Duck Coffee, Lucky Duck, Looking Glass Duck Club Podcast, Gundog Outdoors, Goose Creek Retrievers, Bangtail Whiskey, Eyesight Drones, Sample Dunn Outfitters.